So an interesting sort of related topic to the bakery is uh, handling change. Uh, I imagine that most of you would consider me a trustworthy source for the topic of change. Our world has changed quite a bit and it's only been, hasn't been that long. Uh, but in truth, the last year has been uh, a lesser degree of change overall than the years that came before it, uh, except those years just weren't as public. And the change wasn't as easy to understand because the change was all just within the bakery itself, uh, adapting to the different seasons, adapting to just a younger business with less stability. Uh, what we found, which I think is worth noting that as things get busier, which for us, uh, the winter months get busier. So beginning in October every year, things just get progressively busier all the way through spring before they slow down for the summer again. Uh, and as things get busier, you have to learn to adapt. Uh, we've always had issues with things like space, uh, both temperature, well, and that's another form of space because we've always had refrigeration, but we haven't had enough of it. So really space. Well, in the beginning, we had not, not even, we had one sink and AC. Yeah, temperature in here was really rough. So, you know, really over time, we've just found more ways to control for, for both of our temperature and the amount that we have available to us at any given amount. So we have more refrigeration space, we have more ambient space, uh, we have more oven space. And you know, when you're in that process of growth, you have to adapt over time because you know, everybody's sort of using all their resources to the, to the fullest extent they can at any given moment, even when they're not using them maximally. So when you start adding more, you've got to find ways to, uh, to do that. Uh, so if you look at it more on a macro point of view for a community of people working together, we have experienced the most instability probably about this time of year, February, March, because coming off of several months in a row of typical ramp up, uh, it usually hits us hard uh, because Every year there's been something unexpected. And meanwhile, we've been trying to grow the base to accommodate, like build, build the infrastructure here. This year, of course, we're building a new bakery. So we haven't had the uh, sort of luxury of just being able to work on baking. It's always comforting when Amanda and I are on the table together because that feels the, uh, it's really one of the most simple and rooted activities that we have. Uh, and so that, that sort of leads me to my next point that you might find yourself in periods of instability, especially if you're growing. Uh, and, and those instabilities might come in different form factors. It might be instability amongst your team. It might be instability financially. It might be a little bit of both. It might be instability on things that you can't control. Uh, and when you do, as we have on a number of occasions, every time what we've done is just go back to, go backwards to basics, uh, meaning return to simpler, simpler basics. So simplifying the menu, uh, going back to roles that, that perhaps left behind some time ago, uh, and sort of rebuilding. So I've found that my most active seasons inside the bakery over the past few years have always been January, February, March, uh, often because there's just uh, a need for a reset around those times, a need to get grounded again in, uh, in the basics, uh, a need to look at all the changes that occurred over a 12-month period and evaluate what changes should stick and what changes should uh, what changes should uh, perhaps not, what changes were good for the year but not good for the whole type deal. Uh, so 
we're in such a period right now as we transition uh, into our new space. We're just trying to um, establish the team that's going to be going into our new space with us, the routines that we, uh, that we want, uh, the type of team dynamics that we're looking for. Uh, on our products, we're making sure that, that the people who work for us have an understanding of the core of what we do. When our menu gets a little bit too large at times, um, you can lose sight of the regular items, the items that never go away, in favor of just constantly being in a mode of thinking about specials. And uh, I think after this past year in particular and all that it has brought, uh, specials and changes were part of the things that we use to keep people engaged. But as we find ourselves preparing to go into a new space, uh, preparing for a new beginning, uh, uh, it, Amanda and I increasingly have been just discussing getting more rooted again into uh, the things that have brought us here in the first place. And right now on the table is, is such a thing, our local sourdough, uh, because this bread really uh, is what it's all about, just flour, water, and salt the simplicity of flour, water, and salt uh, in, in great juxtaposition to the 15 or 16 different ingredient breads that you find almost everywhere that you look for bread. Um, and so there's a simple message every time that we make this kind of bread, and that's don't let things get too complicated that you lose sight of uh, the core. And it, it, in this time, I think that's what I'm reflecting on most is just, I want to move into our new location, into our new bakery with a solid, with a solid foundation. What are your thoughts on this stuff? I agree with you. I mean, if it was up to me, I would love it if we could just make sourdough all day. Um, because it's really the foundation of even our specials, they don't really, deviate that much from sourdough we just add the stuff in for you like gochujang or green olives which you know at the end of the day what is a green olive loaf except for like a piece of sourdough toast with an olive tapenade on it you know so i'm a big fan of just keeping it simple actually that was like a big lesson i in elementary school I don't know why I always remember it, but my elementary school teacher, Mr. Pizer, would always tell us, keep it simple, stupid. It's like, it's just a natural human thing to just complicate and overcomplicate over things. So that's something I've taken to heart. <clears throat> and I think whenever we do that, we find new ground. We find ways to make things better because you have a solid footing you know you're doing the same thing every day when something like your processes are static then you can go back and evaluate and see today things look like this tomorrow how can we make it better and yet the season of specials the season of hyper change the season of new is also important and has its time. In, in our case, the last year has been plenty of that. It's been nonstop because, you know, the, the global uh, situation uh, with, with uh, the pandemic in March and what led into then the idea of having to move and the initial plannings in that. And then furthermore, just the regular holiday season of any other year, which, you know, it, we experience typically more customers uh, getting introduced to our bread during that time. So uh, it's been difficult uh, to uh, stay consistent with our customers because there's been so much fear going around that that created a huge impact on how many people show up at any given moment to buy bread. Uh, and so that fluctuation was best met with a lot of changes. Uh, you know, uh, new specials, new flavors, new reasons to come out and support your local baker. But as we, as we move to a completely new chapter now, 
uh, which involves our, our bakery, that's becoming the foundation piece now. It, it, in fact, there's more and more gravity each day that's pulling us towards that new bakery. More and more of our attention is going towards what's our life going to be like over there. In, in some cases, some of the staff here really haven't felt that change yet. Like, but it, in my world right now, just a couple months ahead of time, every move that I'm making is intentional so that when we do move, everybody does feel the change in the right way. Because it's also difficult on everyone to constantly be changing, to constantly be in a, in a dynamic environment. Uh, I would love a little bit more routine, <laughs> you know? I can't wait, actually, for a little bit more routine. Uh, and this is coming from somebody that probably has a stomach of change that uh, tolerates more than the average in terms of change. But gosh, am I craving some routine right now. And you know, being here in the bakery with Amanda, uh, it, it actually satisfies that craving quite a bit. Uh, we we're just remarking on uh, how much happier I've been this week versus uh, in, in the months past leading up. And really one of the only changes this week was I found myself in the bakery a whole lot more than I've been in the last few months. Uh, and, and it's nice to get to the point with your sourdough or with your bread baking or whatever type of thing it is that you do, because I think this applies beyond baking bread, uh, that you can do something and you can do it with pleasure because you understand it enough to where it's not a stressor just to learn how to, how to engage with it. Uh, sourdough bread. Yeah. Because in the beginning, you, you kind of got that it was meditative, but I'm not sure that I did. I, <laughs> the beginnings were stressful, though. I was... I'm a lot happier in the bakery nowadays just because we have gained some of the efficiencies like a mixer and I'm not bending over a giant trough of <laughs> dough trying to lift it and manipulate it. Um, so I think we've hit like a sweet spot in terms of that goes, in terms of that, um, whereas where it only takes one one person on the mixer instead of several hands mixing different bowls. Um, and then we can all come together on the table like this. Like it's the most fun for me growing up in a kitchen with family, always in the kitchen all together, like to have everybody around the table like this. That's been a common recurring theme amongst people who've been attracted to the bakery too. We've had our fair share of people over the years that were attracted to the bakery based on childhood memories of being in the kitchen with their family members. Uh, certainly that's something that Amanda and I had in common from our, from our household. Kitchen work can be, uh, oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> kitchen work can be kind of brutal in terms of hours when you do it professionally because you know, working over 24 hours straight is, is something that's happened to us on a number of occasions by necessity. Uh, and even if you don't own a place, uh, working 16 hour days is not uncommon sometimes in the kitchen world. But then again, working with food also takes on a different characteristic altogether where for whatever reason, I think you can take more, meaning you can work a little harder when it, when it means that you're feeding somebody, when it, when it means that it's going to something as basic as uh, nutrition. After a while, this just becomes muscle memory. Like I could do this with my eyes closed. So it's kind of a, just a nice, it's just a nice way of bonding. To all of those out there that hear those words, I could do this with my eyes closed and uh, feel maybe intimidated by that statement. Uh, it's true, uh, as, sh as hard as shaping might be in the beginning, uh, it's something that 
that really does get a lot better with practice. Yeah, we've got hours and hours. And that's what I tell people, like when, when they're first starting out in the bakery, I just let them know, like, you're not gonna be good at this. It's your first time. So give yourself, start with that grace. What's that, what's that saying that you've been? I feel like, I don't know, when I've ever, whenever I've been uncomfortable with something, like I'll just call it out and then I feel immediately better. So I try to set the stage for that with, when newbies are on the table, because we all have a tendency to just be so hard on ourselves. And I know for myself, like I've had to work on that a lot to like give myself grace and compassion that I might not be good at this the first time, especially with him. Like he pushes me to my limits <laughs> and out of my comfort zone. So um, calling it out and just giving yourself grace is key. At any given moment, you need something that's sort of fueling you to keep going. Uh, and I'm looking for the type of fuel now that will carry me for a longer period of time. I'm, I'm looking for a more sustainable fuel, one that uh, doesn't burn up so quickly. Uh, I know that I've relied on all kinds of fuel over the years. Uh, in the beginning of this thing, when it was unsustainable to begin with, the business was, the time load was, yeah, everything about it was unsustainable to make it a full-time thing or a full-time lifestyle. So the only way to do that was to have a different type of fuel. Uh, that was partially adrenaline, that was partially... Uh, what? Coffee. <laughs> Lots of coffee. I think we tried everything back then. I, you remember the five hour energies late at night? That oh. was like the only things that got me to actually hour 24 at, at one point. I struggle a little bit because I feel like I'm just rediscovering a better rhythm right now for us. Um, rhythm is only as ideal as your, your worst bottleneck. So uh, in our case, we started to sort of fall apart in terms of infrastructure around late summer here where we were making too much bread for what we have and it was still really hot outside. Phoenix experienced over 50 consecutive days over 110 degrees and that lasted well into almost early fall. Uh, and during that time we had to add a second shift of mixing because uh, we just could no longer fit the mixes all in one. And we're still there right now. My goal is to get back to a, to a different rhythm by the time we get to our new space. But it, now it requires sort of pulling everybody slowly back to a production model that we're producing maybe over a 12 hour interval over the day, as opposed to right now where we're actually in production close to 20 hours a day, uh, just spread out, spread out completely. Uh, we had to originally do that uh, when, when our fridges weren't keeping up and so we just had to add more layering and more shifts and also create more checks so that uh, if the fridge were to fail, you know, uh, the bread is actually going to get baked thereafter, not that long. We had to reduce the amount of time we were holding on to things in order to sort of meet the high capacity. But in that way, it, once you sort of lose the ideal rhythm for the whole team, uh, slowly uh, things sort of degrade. Uh, morale degrades. A lot of things start to degrade over time. Uh, so right now we're, we're kind of uh, countering what we had to do a few months ago by simplifying. So one of the things that I did was we moved back from, from on-demand predictive baking uh, to order to setting pars and having a little bit more pressure to sell a certain amount of bread, but also having a cap to how much that bread was. Uh, and, and in setting pars, I look at my week and decide the amount of bread that I think that we can sell through the week based on the data that we have. 
And then we can sort of get in control of our time again. We can plan things out the most efficiently. Uh, what we try to do around here is make sure that there's some redundancy and backup because you never know what's happening. You don't need to be in a global pandemic for the instability of everyday life. Somebody can uh, you know, not be able to come into work for one reason or another and you wanna be in a position where you can cover it if, if you need to. Actually, you wanna be in a position that if several people don't come into work, you can somehow find a way through. So, but the problem with that is it's a little bit more expensive. You, you need a little bit more hands on deck uh, and more trained staff. And so we're trying to find that healthy balance right now uh, to, that will carry us into our, our, our new space. This week, I think the schedule that I set, which you know, laid out somewhat simply, uh, we start the day with mixing. Of course, there is, uh, there is the sourdough starter, which is already getting prepared for the day. Having a good management ritual of that is, is sort of critical and independent of the rest of the schedule. But we start our day with mixing. The mixer is really arriving uh, about an hour and a half earlier than everybody else. Uh, and that person can turn on the ovens uh, and get the ovens loaded. Uh, that person can check on things. If there are things proofing from the night before, that person can, can make some decisions, um, get a semblance of how the day goes. We like for the mixer to be also a sort of a pace setter for the day uh, because they have an idea of when the doughs are gonna be ready for the table. And if they're good at communicating with the rest of their team, uh, they can sort of uh, make sure that everybody's ready to help on the table. The type of model that we like to build around here is that we build roles around the table, like on a dough sheeter or on a mixer or on an oven. And then we try to, we try to map our day so that uh, people can come off of the oven and join on the table during scaling time. Uh, alternatively, people can uh, jump off the sheeter and jump on the table during scaling time. The mixer, of course, uh, also. So uh, the, the rhythm of, of our bakery is very much surrounding that, that we work sort of independently at first in our roles. So we try to make it so that somebody can start their day immediately laminating pastry. That means we need everything ready to go for the person who's laminating pastry in the morning. Um, similarly, we uh, need the mixer to have everything they need ready to go. That's a little bit easier, but in a sourdough bakery, the complication is just making sure the starter is fed and mature each morning for that mixer. Uh, the ovens, of course, uh, also can start earlier. Uh, and, it, and it's important to build a good oven schedule because uh, you can really find efficiencies based on what should be baked first and what should be baked last. Generally, if you have things that bake at lower temperatures uh, and hotter temperatures and you're sharing an oven, you wanna bake the things that are lower temperature first so that you're not trying to cool down the oven, which is significantly harder than heating it back up. Uh, generally speaking, uh, if you have products that need to be sliced, you wanna bake those ahead of products that don't to allow for them to cool down. Uh, you should look at also things that are a little bit more finer in detail. We have English muffins that we bake in the same oven that we bake our artisan loaves in. We like to bake the English muffins first in the day because the sides of the oven haven't heated up as dramatically yet. And we actually don't care about side heat on the English muffins because we're trying to replicate a flat top. And so, it's better to bake those ahead of a sourdough loaf, which we really like it to have all around heat. As the oven heats during the morning, it gets more effective at baking uh, later on during the day than it did if it's starting cold. A lot of the bigger ovens, especially if you are as crazy as us uh, and get a deck oven in your, in your garage, uh, they're designed for continual use, but you won't use them continually. Uh, and so, you know, those are all things that can factor into mapping your day. Uh, we like to do mundane activities as a group. Uh, so yesterday, an example of that, which I sort of reintroduced was uh, 
butter preparation for croissant dough. We had to prepare like seven sheets of butter, but we had a whole group here since we have these culinary students from South Carolina this week. And together we, we uh, got through those butters so quickly. The day before, one of the people that were helping uh, had done it solo and immediately saw the value in teaming up on those type of activities. So whenever you have something that's very repetitive and takes a while to get through, uh, like packaging bread also, a second person packaging is worth more than two people individually packaging, uh, meaning the two people together are worth more than the sum of their parts. Uh, Actually, in packaging, we found that we do best with, with crews of three. Oh, thank you. So all of that sort of has to influence your decisions and your planning. Um, and, and also, like, even where you take your business. Because uh, if you find that you want, you function best with, with a three-person packaging team, of course, you need to have enough bread to merit a three-person packaging team. And until you do, you've got to find another way. Uh, and there's a million ways to do this type of work. Uh, you know, there's bakeries that function around the world at all kinds of scale from single person to, to uh, I imagine that the biggest ones have thousands of employees. Uh, and you can find yourself anywhere in there. For us, it's all about finding the balance for us and everybody who works for us. And we still have a little ways to go to get there, but that's all we're trying to hope for is, is everybody who works for us uh, happy with what they do? Are they, are they able to pay their bills? Are they doing for, uh, and then are, is our life fulfilled and balanced? Uh, once we feel like we've hit that sort of milestone for our community, then growing will not be a priority to the same extent anymore. Oh, that feels really nice that uh, the first hand scale of the day, 800 is the target weight. So just uh, some mornings just go like that. What's your, what's your range? What's your range? I mean, I go for, for plus or minus 10 grams, but uh, I think that that's a pretty, uh, that's a pretty fine range uh, and it maybe doesn't have to be so rigid. It, I, I suppose it really depends all on your audience. Uh, but for, for me, I think plus or minus 10 is a pretty good, good thing. So with the by hand ones, we, we pre-round them. There's something that the divider does that hand scaling doesn't. It adds a step and that's, it actually kind of stretches the dough as it like lifts it up after division, it stretches it all out and pretty much replicates the same tensioning that happens during this rounding stage, uh, saving us a step. It's one of the chief reasons why we ended up uh, switching to a model where we uh, use the divider. Uh, my general view on tools is the tool not only has to make things more efficient, but it has to make things at least the same quality. If it makes them better, then that's, that's uh, really what I'm looking for. And, and the divider, even though it's one of those things that is a line people draw, some, some artists and bakeries don't use a divider. This is a bull. Uh, for us, we still saw value in both efficiency and quality in using one. And so that was why we ultimately made that call. Nothing with hand scaling bread. It's an important skill set. We just don't get to practice it with as many reps anymore as we used to. We usually get a couple bins a day by hand and the rest are through the divider. Uh, and that seems to work. Uh, if I get concerned over people's scaling ability, I would just simply make them scale more bins uh, by hand. You can still work on the older methodology. You don't have to give up the the techniques as you gain tools that, that help. In fact, I would encourage not giving them up. We're still very much informed by hand mixing. We, we still hand mix our, uh, our sourdough starter right now. Um, 
And so we haven't lost a connection to our roots. We still test batches with, by hand. Uh, it's, it's important to keep track of all those skills that you've accumulated along the way, even when a tool can replace some of them.